Okay, uh, good morning. Uh, it's my great honor to chair today's seminar. <clears throat> the speaker is, uh, is a very famous uh, you know, scientist in, in the world. Actually, she just traveled more than 26 hours <laughs> yeah, from the uh, US to, to Hong Kong. So, uh, Professor Karen Wooney is uh, the WT Doherty Welch Chair in Chemistry and the University Distinguished Professor at Texas A&M University, where she holds appointments in the Department of Chemistry, Chemical Engineering, and the Materials Science and the Engineering. She also serves as the Director of the Laboratory for Synthetic Biological Interactions. Her research interests include uh, the synthesis and the characterization of uh, degradable polymers derived from uh, natural products, unique macromolecular architectures, and the complex polymer assemblies, and the design and the development of well-defined nanostructured materials. Recent awards include uh, the American Chemical Society Award in Polymer Chemistry in 2014, Royal Society of Chemistry uh, Centenary Prize, also in 2014. Oh, and another one, the final of the Royal Society of Chemistry in the same year. And uh, she was uh, elected as uh, honorable, honor, honorary final of uh, Chinese Chemical Society and uh, received this uh, OSP award in 2015, and the final of the uh, American Academy of Arts and uh, Sciences in 2015. Karen currently serves as uh, associate editor for the Journal of uh, American Chemical Society, among many other advisory roles uh, within the broad scientific community. So actually, I started to read her paper when she was a student in three years lab <laughs> because uh, I was at that time I was uh, at the University of Toronto because I was also interested in, in the research you know she was uh, carrying on okay and uh, actually she's going to visit Zhongshan University in, in Guangzhou and uh, thanks for for the kind of arrangement okay I was trying to invite her many many times and uh, actually last oh last April we had a conference in Guangzhou. We invited her last year, but uh, as you, you know, she has a very, very busy schedule. So my invitation was a little bit late. <laughs> okay. And uh, next meeting will be Shanghai. I told my co-chair in Shanghai to invite you earlier. <laughs> okay, hopefully <laughs> we can meet again in Shanghai. Okay, without further delay, let's uh, welcome Karen to deliver her lecture. Um, functional polymer materials designed for advanced applications and uh, sustainability, yeah, please. Thank you. I'd like to thank Professor Tong and Professor Zhou for the invitation to be here and speak with you. And I'm delighted to see so many students in the audience. Um, I don't know what you guys are thinking about for your career paths and, and how you move forward and what kind of research you're interested in. But myself, I've always wanted to make things that could do things. And so I've always thought about making polymers that can have a function and that can serve in some application. And today the application is going to be one that's related to sustainability, and that's to the cleanup of um, contaminations and, and spills that occur in the environment. And we're focusing on crude oil spills in the discussion today. But the other aspect of sustainability is, is in terms of how we make these materials and what we make them from. And my lab over the last probably decade has been focusing substantially on using natural products as the building blocks to construct functional materials so that after they perform their function, they can break back down into those natural products. So that's going to be the overall theme of the, of the discussion today. And I encourage you to ask questions uh, throughout if you, if you have one that, that you'd like to have answered. And um, then we can have an, an open discussion. But let me, let me uh, frame the, the context of, of what we're going to go through in the, in the discussion today. And that is, um, again, the, the need to create materials that can address important challenges. And one challenge that we had recognized back when the Deepwater 
Horizon oil spill occurred in the Gulf of Mexico in 2010 was that there's an issue with cleaning up crude oil spills that goes beyond the bulk of the oil. And in this image here, I don't know if you can see it from where you are, there's a sheen, a colorful sheen of a thin layer of oil that's floating on the surface of the water. And that small amount of oil that's residual is a, is pr a problem uh, in terms of toxicity to the environment. There's also cases where the oil is beneath the surface of the water. I don't know if you can see there's some oil that's submerged here. And those pockets of oil are difficult to, to clean up as well. And so we had anticipated that we could build nanotechnological devices that could address both of these uh, challenges, the surface uh, thin layer of, of oil that's residual as well as uh, oil that's beneath the surface. And we had anticipated that if these um, nanotechnological devices could be comprised of organic polymers, they would sequester the crude oil, the hydrocarbons, and if they also had embedded within them inorganic nanoparticles that are magnetically responsive, then after they pick up the crude oil, they could be collected by using a, a magnet. So we call these um, materials uh, hybrid inorganic organic nanoparticles. And again, our goal is to address environmental pollutants. In this particular case, we're focusing on, on uh, crude oil, but I'll also show you that there are other pollutants that we're also targeting. And then, as I said, the, the other um, uh, part of the sustainability uh, that's related to this work is that we're building these materials now out of natural products. The first work I'll show you is not um, based on natural product building blocks. But as we're progressing through the work, now we're focusing, as I said, uh, almost entirely on using natural product building blocks. So things like glucose or other sugars. Um, I'll take a little bit of a detour during the, the presentation to tell you about a couple of biphenolic monomers that we're using. These are also natural products. They derive from magnolia trees and how we're using those to produce engineering kinds of plastics that can replace uh, engineering plastics that you might be familiar with like bisphenol A polycarbonate. Okay, so that's the overall uh, structure of, of the discussion. Um, so let's get down to, uh, again, the background of, of why we got started in this, in this field uh, to begin with back in about 2010. And it, again, it was after the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. And this is an image of, a, of an oil spill that happened uh, on a river, not, not in, the, in the Gulf of Mexico. But it, it illustrates some of the techniques that are used to, to try to uh, first contain the oil by using these booms that, that don't allow flow downstream. And then there are pumping systems that can be brought in to uh, withdraw the oil that's floating on, on the surface of the water. Now, as I said, one of the key challenges is that even after that process, there could be this submerged oil and there's also the, the residual thin layer of sheen. So to get to the, the residual thin layer that's um, floating on the surface, um, there are techniques that are used. These include things like polyethylene or polypropylene uh, mats that can be laid out on the surface of the water uh, to absorb the uh, oil that's floating uh, remaining on the surface. Um, and you can see that these aren't very efficient. Only one face of the, of the mat is in contact with the oil surface. The other face isn't being uh, employed in this, in this um, collection of the oil. There, it's also a laborious process. The workers had to lay them all out, wait for them to soak up the oil, and then come back and retrieve them, um, bag them up and haul them away. And um, the, the third problem with them is that they, they don't go beneath the surface to get the oil that, that might be submerged. Okay, and as I said, we had anticipated that maybe a, a nanotechnological solution could be, could be found. And so this is meant to represent an, an image of, of a water uh, source that's contaminated with uh, crude oil or another pollutant. We would again deploy these hybrid inorganic organic nanoparticles. They would then uh, sequester the, the crude oil within the core by hydrophobic interactions between hydrocarbons in the particles with hydrocarbons that are in the crude oil. And then a magnet could be used to collect them. And then the oil could be extracted and the, and the particles could be recycled. Again, this, is, this was the overall uh, plan for the project. 
Okay, I want to take a, a bit of a moment, I, and I know I'm, I, I'm in a place where everyone knows what nano is, but I like to show this slide because it lets me bring my kids on the road with me. Um, so when I think about nano and, and the particles that we're making in the lab, if we make a, a particle that's 100 nanometers in diameter, we would have to multiply it by 10 to the 7th to get to one meter, which was the size of my children um, about 20 years ago. And um, now, this is a picture from just a couple of years ago. Um, if, the, if they're about a meter or two in, in size, we'd have to multiply them by 10 to the seventh to get to the size of the Earth. And so when I think about the particles we're making, I consider them to be comparable in size to myself as I am to the world. And that's a, a, an interesting way, I think, to put this into perspective. Okay, so let me get back to the, to the science. Um, I had shown you this schematic illustration of a, of a particle that has these inorganic nanoparticles embedded within our organic polymer framework. So that's one design that, that we had set forth for, for these um, hybrid systems that were going to perform this overall function. A second design we thought would be one where we could have preformed organic particles that are optimized for capturing things like crude oil or other contaminants and then couple those onto the inorganic particle. And so we call these magnetic hybrid networks, uh, whereas these are, are called magnetic shell crosslink kinetal-like nanoparticles. And kinetal is a, a dumpling. So this has a, a core shell morphology, whereas this one is more like a, a network morphology. And the way that we access um, both of these types of structures is by the same overall process. So we start with small molecules, link them together into polymers, where those polymers are programmed to undergo supramolecular assembly into a nanostructure. Uh, that nanostructure can then be stabilized, say, through crosslinking throughout the shell of the structure. And then those uh, preformed organic particles can be coupled to the inorganic particles and make the, to make the network. Alternatively, if we don't assemble the polymers uh, alone, but rather do a co-assembly process between the polymers and, and the inorganic nanoparticles, then this can create the, um, the alternate uh, shell crosslink kinetal-like architecture. Okay, so we're going to start on these magnetic shell crosslink kinetals, and I'll show you um, how they were synthesized and, and how they perform. Uh, this work was done several years ago by Adriana Pavia Sanders, who was a PhD student in my laboratory. And we published this work, like I said, several years ago, so about five years ago. But it still serves as the foundation material that has the ultimate performance in, in terms of the uh, ability to clean up water that's contaminated with crude oil. So this design, uh, again, involves the inorganic nanoparticles captured within a hydrophobic core region of an organic polymer uh, particle that also has hydrophilic uh, units uh, around the shell to allow for it to be dispersed throughout an aqueous phase. And then it's all linked together through crosslinks to have a stable structure. So it's a very simple process to make it. Uh, initially, amphiphilic block copolymers are synthesized here based upon polyacrylic acid block polystyrene in this, in this example. Uh, these amphiphilic block copolymers then are co-assembled with inorganic, in this case, iron oxide nanoparticles uh, by transitioning from organic solvent systems into water that creates this micellar assembly where the inorganic particles are trapped within the organic polymer framework. And then a diamino crosslinker is added together with a carbodiamid to facilitate amide bond formation and, and establish the crosslinks throughout the shell of the particles. So this was our, our original, again, strategy and scheme. And it was remarkable that when Adriana characterized the products from, from this process, she found that the morphology actually matched what we had uh, targeted. So when you look at the TEM, image here, you see that the particles are fairly uniform in size. There's some heterogeneity in the size of the particles. But when we zoom in on any one particle, there's significant heterogeneity in terms of the contrast, which is an illustration of the presence of both the inorganic and organic components uh, within uh, this, this particle. And the sizes are, are about what we were targeting, about 80 nanometers in diameter by dynamic light scattering, about 70 nanometers in diameter in the dry state. And when we look at the 3D tomographic image, that confirms that the inorganic particles are, in fact, within the organic framework, not just decorated on the outside of the structure. Okay, so Adriana then conducted a series of experiments where she had vials uh, containing water and then crude oil floating on the surface. And after deployment of the particles and waiting just a matter of minutes, you can see that 
uh, what's happened is there's no longer any visible crude oil floating on the surface. There are these clusters or, or aggregates of, of particles that are dark in color uh, that are floating on, on the surface. So initially the particles are uh, a light brown color and they can disperse in, in water. And after they fill with the crude oil, they float to the surface and, and aggregate together. That actually facilitates the collection because we can put a magnet right next to the vial and they migrate over uh, to the wall and then the remaining solution can be decanted and analyzed to see uh, how much uh, crude oil is remaining. And so that was done by chromatographic method. And when we look at the um, experiments that Adriana conducted, she was using proportions of the particles to the crude oil that were always excess crude oil. So 1 to 3, 1 to 5, 1 to 11, 1 to 17. And what you can see is remarkably the percent oil recovered is always about 80% until she goes out to the 1 to 17 uh, ratio. And then the, the, the um, percent oil recovered drops down to almost 50%. But that means that there's about 10 milligrams of crude oil picked up per milligram of these particles. So they can take up 10 times their mass. Eventually, the system becomes uh, overwhelmed. And at this point, this is where a pump or something would be used to, to withdraw the oil. Okay, in addition, um, the crude oil is a complex mixture of hydrocarbons, and this is a GC mass spec uh, trace for the uh, crude oil sample after just a, a weathering process. And when she analyzed what fractions of the crude oil were picked up by the particles, you can see they overlay almost identically. So even though those, these particles are quite simple, being comprised of polystyrene and polyacrylic acid with those amide crosslinkers, they're able to uh, capture the complex uh, mixture of hydrocarbons present in the crude oil. Okay, so perfluoroctanoic acid, the chemical structure is shown here. This, is, this has been used uh, in industrial processes, especially for things like Teflon, uh, fluoro, fluorocarbon-based uh, substances, and it's a contaminant uh, widely uh, in various regions throughout the US and, and other parts of the world. The problem with perfluoroctanoic acid is that it's biopersistent and environmentally persistent. And I'll show you just a couple of um, uh, news uh, pieces here. Um, you know, this, is, this has been in the news, you may be familiar with it, but there, there are these contaminations of uh, perfluoroctanoic acid, which is also called C8 in various regions. Uh, C8 is toxic. It's been linked to uh, several diseases, including testicular and kidney cancers. Um, and, they, and the problem is that it's in something like 99% of the human population in the US, it's circulating in their bloodstream. And that's because it, it binds to serum proteins and, and like I said, persists uh, as it's circulating. And there's also been an estimate that in, in one, at least in one case of 20 children uh, tested, 19 had uh, their blood contaminated with perfluoroctanoic acid. So how are we going to clean it up? Well, we had anticipated that maybe we could take the uh, structures that Adriana had been working on uh, for crude oil and incorporate some, what, what are shown here as green, some fluorocarbon components that would be able to interact with the fluorocarbon tail of the perfluoroctanoic acid. And then also look into using uh, functionalities in the shell that might uh, interact with the carboxylic acid head group of perfluoroctanoic acid. Okay, so the chemistry then uh, involved two different kinds of polymer designs. Uh, one that retained the polyacrylic acid as the hydrophilic block that we had been using with the crude oil uh, system and polystyrene, but then incorporating a few fluorocarbon, uh, fluoroalkyl uh, based and, and fluoroaromatic uh, fluorinated um, repeat units in that polystyrene chain segment. The second replaced the polyacrylic acid with an amino ethyl acrylamide to allow for acid-base interactions between that amine or ammonium group and the carboxylic acid or carboxylate of the perfluoroctanoic acid. So four polymers were made where the degrees of polymerization of the hydrophilic versus hydrophobic um, block segments were, were varied. Uh, one where the hydrophobic segment is about 100 and another where it's about twice that uh, for each of these uh, four polymers. And then these, after these uh, polymers were synthesized, then they were assembled into, co-assembled with the iron oxide inorganic nanoparticles as we had done previously. And in the case of the polyacrylic acid uh, based system, those, uh, those assembly processes led to well-defined particles and those could be cross-linked to give uh, well-defined the shell cross-linked analogs of those materials. Okay, so for both of those, we could um, produce well-defined 
materials. Now, the challenge came with the amino ethyl acrylamido uh, based polymer, where in this case, uh, the reversible addition fragmentation chain transfer polymerization that was used to produce this polymer required that the styrenal block be uh, grown first, followed by the acrylamido. And that placed this carbon 12 trithiocarbonate group on the end of the hydrophilic block. So this block polymer is actually hydrophobic, hydrophilic, and then it's got this hydrophobic tail. So when this was uh, attempted to undergo assembly in an aqueous solution, uh, poorly defined uh, assemblies were obtained, as you can see here, uh, for both of these polymers. So all we had to do is simply remove this trithiocarbonate chain end um, by reduction, and that then uh, could be followed by UV visible spectroscopy, as, as is typically done and, and as has been uh, published. And by after removal of those uh, C12 chain ends off of those polymers, now they're hydrophobic, hydrophilic, and they could undergo uh, supramolecular assembly in water to give well-defined structures. So we obtained all these particles and then started investigating how well they could collect perfluoroctanoic acid from an aqueous solution. These experiments were done in D2O so that we could use fluorine 19 NMR spectroscopy to quantify the amount of perfluoroctanoic acid remaining in the solution. So again, the particles uh, were added to a solution of uh, perfluoroctanoic acid in D2O. Uh, then they were shaken. And then uh, a magnet was used uh, to separate the particles so that um, the solution could be analyzed. So you can see, uh, this is real-time video, how quickly these um, respond to the magnetic field and, and migrate to the wall of the, of the vial so that the uh, remaining solution can be uh, collected and analyzed. Okay, and so in the analysis then, there was a, a trifluoroacetic acid spike that was added, and that simply gives an internal reference so that we can quantify um, the amount of perfluoroctanoic acid by looking at this terminal trifluoromethyl group in comparison to the known quantity of trifluoroacetic acid that was added as an internal reference. Okay, so in the quantification of the removal of the perfluoroctanoic acid from these uh, D2O solutions, uh, in the first polymer having uh, acrylic acid and the relatively shorter polystyrene uh, segment, didn't perform very well. It was able to remove about 25% of the perfluoroctanoic acid. Um, the second one was able to uh, do a bit better and get 35% of the perfluoroctanoic acid captured within the particles and migrated uh, by the magnetic field. And the two polymers that were expected to perform well, the ones that had the amino group for interaction with the carboxylic acid head group, actually performed quite a bit worse, only about 13 and 10 percent removal of the perfluoroctanoic acid. So our current hypothesis is that uh, the removal of the perfluoroctanoic acid by these particles here was better because those particles are larger. They're, they're quite a bit larger in diameter than are the two particles that have the uh, amino uh, ethyl acrylamide group. So we haven't published this work yet. We have some more experiments to do to go back and understand this uh, better and, and figure out um, what factors contribute to the performance of the materials in terms of the fundamental chemistry. But still, at, at this point, when, with the removal of 35% of the perfluoroctanoic acid, that's about a third of a milligram of perfluoroctanoic acid per milligram of the particles. So that's still orders of magnitude better than other materials that are out there. So we're excited about the, these materials and, and, and proceeding uh, further with them. So now if I come to the second type of, of morphology, uh, the one that's the magnetic hybrid network, um, the reason we started thinking about making that structure is because we had considered, well, if we have one particle that has a core that is optimized to capture crude oil, another that's optimized to, say, capture perfluoroctanoic acid or some other uh, contaminant, maybe we want, we want one that's going to pick up arsenic or mercury or something, then we would in a, in, a, in a complex, polluted environment, we might want to have an ability to have, again, one particle that picks up one kind of pollutant connected to another particle that picks up another kind of pollutant and have those clustered on an, a magnetic uh, core. And so Jenny took on this project, and then uh, we ran into some uh, challenges. And instead of obtaining this type of morphology, she obtained the kinds of hybrid network that, that is shown here. And so let me go through what um, her process was. 
So in Jenny's case, she again took uh, polycrylic acid block polystyrene, uh, now not co-assembling it with iron oxide nanoparticles, but rather just assembling it into micelles and then cross-linking the shell through the same kind of amidation chemistry to, to build in these stabilization uh, linkages throughout the shell of the structure. Those particles were then uh, coupled to the inorganic iron oxide particles by having an amino group on the iron oxide particles, or actually there's a whole number of amino groups on this particle, um, uh, and then allowing that to undergo reaction with residual carboxylic acids that are present in the initial, uh, what we would call shell crosslink kinetolite particle. So, we, again, had anticipated that we, we, we would be able to um, couple the organic particles onto the inorganic particles. But what was found by transmission electron microscopy is what you see down here. And there were, there were places where the contrast was such that it appeared as though there were organic particles coupled to one another and inorganic and organic particles coupled to one another. And we couldn't quite understand what was happening in, in these regions here because theoretically the amines are on the inorganic particles and that carboxylic acids are on the organic particles. Um, so then Ying Chao Chen, who was a PhD student with Darren Po Chen at the University of Delaware, conducted some cryo EM imaging and found that in fact, yes, the organic particles are coupled to one another even in the solution state. And so Jenny started uh, investigating what was happening here. And what she found was that if she took the chemistry as, as, um, inten as initially intended and used a carbodiamide to facilitate the amide bond formation between the amine and the carboxylic acid, then that gave a coupling of the, of the particles together. And so that gives the magnetic hybrid networks. And she could see that th those were present in both the supernatant and the precipitate after a centrifugation step. But if she instead did not add the carbodiamide and just simply had a physical mixture of the inorganic and organic particles and centrifuged them and then collected the precipitate and the supernatant, she could see that the precipitate uh, is enriched in the inorganic particles and the supernatant is, is basically uh, entirely organic particles, so they're not coupling together. So the key was this um, addition of the carbodiamide. And so what we had to do is we had to go back and remember that, as I pointed out here, we have a polyacrylic acid that's in the shell of this micelle. We're adding a diamine and a carbodiamide that's forming amide linkages, but the other end of that uh, diamine can either be an amine, it can be an amide, so there are residual amines present. So these particles where we show them having residual carboxylic acids, they actually have combinations of carboxylic acids and amines. And it's only after we add a second dose of the carbodiamide that those are able to couple uh, to one another. OK, so that's a long story. Here's one more control study. Um, she made the particles initially after the, the one addition of the, of the carbodiamide, and then she added a second dose of carbodiamide without any inorganic particles present, and she found, in fact, the particles are able to, to connect to one another. So this is just a message that even when you think you know what your chemistry is going to do, and you've been doing it for 20 years, sometimes there are surprises, and you have to follow up on those. OK, so let's get to the performance of uh, Jenny's materials um, in being able to capture crude oil from a vial uh, where the crude oil has been added to, to water. So here you can see a vial here with water and crude oil floating. Here you can see where she's added her um, magnetic hybrid networks as a uh, light brown powder she had collected um, from lyophilization. And after some period of time, minutes to an hour or so, then you can see that there you have darkened in color and they migrate over to interact with the magnetic field. But there's still some residual crude oil here that you can see even in this image. And after decanting that solution and analyzing it, what Jenny was able to find is that her magnetic hybrid network materials were able to uh, pick up about three to four five milligrams of crude oil per milligram of the magnetic hybrid networks. So they're not quite as good as Adriana's materials in, in terms of their overall ability to, to capture the crude oil. But Jenny then uh, took the experiments a, a few steps further and she looked to see um, how much of the material could be uh, recovered by this magnetic process because uh, as I said, if there are organic particles coupled to organic particles, they may not be coupled to an inorganic particle, so they may not feel the magnetic field. They may uh, you know, stay in solution, and we were concerned about uh, adding our particles as further pollutants to a polluted environment. 
She did find that she was able to recover about 90 to 93 uh, percent of the, of the samples, uh, so that's pretty good. We'll come back to that in just a moment. Um, she also found that the percent oil recovery was on the order of about 80 percent recovery, and that she could uh, take the particles after they'd ca captured the oil, extract that oil, recollect the particles and redeploy them multiple times, and in each case they perform to about the same uh, level. Okay, so there's this recyclability that's possible. Okay, then Jenny wanted to really push the system further and see if she could, she could um, capture more oil, and so she began doing some uh, experiments not with crude oil, but rather with uh, dodecane as a model a hydrocarbon. And she began shaking the samples. And, and what you can see here is that she would form then emulsions uh, from those materials. And the emulsification uh, is dependent upon whether it's uh, just water or whether it's a salt solution. So often we were being asked, you know, how well does this perform in, in, a, in salt water, for instance, in the, in the Gulf or in the, in the ocean. And what you can see here is that in uh, water, the particles can capture a lot more of the dodecane uh, than they can in a brine or, or salt solution. And that's because the emulsification is inhibited uh, in the salt solution. So the maximum capacity in water now is about 30 milligrams of dodecane per milligram of hi magnetic hybrid networks, whereas it can get up to about 17 uh, milligrams uh, in the salt solution. Okay, so we, we began uh, looking into how these particles uh, form an emulsion. Um, there's a, there's a term called picking, pickering emulsions. They're, they're common for particles to sit at the oil-water interface and create a, a stabilization of the emulsion. Um, but these particles are unusual in shape. They're these hybrid network-like structures, and so we weren't sure that they would be able to do so. So Jenny labeled the particles, and Soon Me conducted some microscopy uh, imaging, and we did find that the particles, in fact, do sit at the uh, oil water interface in these emulsions. And so they, even though they're oddly shaped, they can still form uh, pickering emulsions. Okay, so this video is um, one that I hope it plays um, that, that is just kind of a fun aside to um, the kinds of um, you know, enjoyable things that you can do in the lab with, with something, but it also has technological relevance. Oh, it's not gonna let me play it, is it? again. Looks like it should play. Oh, media not found. Uh, okay, I copied the file over, but I, it didn't look like it recognized it. Okay, so anyway, these are highly magnetically responsive, and so you can take a magnet and just drag the emulsion all over the vial, and it responds uh, instantaneously. And so we're, we're thinking that these might be useful in, say, cleaning up, say, fracking water and, and, and things, and, and helping to process um, those kinds of um, water sources that aren't necessarily out in a lake or a, an ocean, but they're actually in containers where they have to be cleaned up before they can be released into the environment. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, so let's come back to this uh, 90 to 93 percent recovery of these of these particles. Um, you know, that's that's fine. Uh, that's you know a, a good amount, um, and especially since we were working with materials that we considered not to be uh, hazardous, where polyacrylic acid is the component of baby diapers that causes them to um, be able to capture urine. And uh, polystyrene is simply styrofoam cups, so they're pretty safe, but they're still, they're not degradable. And so uh, you may have been hearing a lot about issues with um, plastic in the environment and the pollution that's being caused, and there's even this great Pacific garbage patch, which is apparently now three times the size of, of France, uh, that's floating in the ocean. Um, and then there's also this other issue that even if the if the plastic isn't large where we can see it, it can, still can be a problem. So um, microbeads are in cosmetics and lots of different products and they're uh, now uh, being banned. So here's a quote from January saying that plastic microbeads can no longer be used in cosmetics and personal care products in the UK. Um, and it, uh, initially it's banning the manufacture of such product. The ban on sales will follow in July. I'm not sure whether that happened or not. But the problem is that these thousands of tons of plastic microbeads are ending up in uh, various places in, in the sea and in wildlife. And so it's something we have to be concerned about. And so what I would encourage you all to do is to 
to, from the very beginning of planning your project, start thinking about what is the whole life cycle of the material. So for, in my case, for many, many years, I, I was only concerned about taking small molecules, linking them together into polymers to get functional performance. I just wanted that functional entity that could do something that could be used in an application. And I wasn't really worried about what would happen after that, because a lot of times we don't think about our materials uh, you know, breaking down. Um, and if they do break down, you think, well, they're, they might be benign, like, like the examples of polystyrene and polyacrylic acid. But we have to think about what the degradation products might be and whether they would be able to be biologically or environmentally resorbed and, and cleared. Um, and so what we've done in my lab um, more recently, like I said, in the last decade or so, is said, well, let's have the degradation go all the way back to the monomer. So let's start with a monomer here where it's something that we want to be able to release upon uh, the end of the performance of the material. So when I said, um, you know, a lot of times things are made and it's considered that they won't break down. They're meant to be robust and remain uh, functional for, for a very long period of time. And one of those materials is bisphenol A polycarbonate. Um, it turns out that bisphenol A polycarbonate is an excellent uh, engineering plastic, and it is robust. It doesn't degrade uh, under most conditions, but under extreme conditions, like in a, in a dishwasher, the high temperatures and, and, and the water and, and the detergents and things can break down the, the polymer and release bisphenol A. So we have been thinking about this, and we thought, well, let's look into nature and see what other biphenolic uh, compounds uh, might be present that we could use to build up an engineering kind of plastic. So if we look uh, in, in this case in uh, magnolia uh, trees, there are uh, neolignans uh, that have uh, phenolic groups. And I'm not showing them on this slide, but they'll come up on the next one. And the first thing I want to point out is that there's this um, term uh, lignin and neolignans. And it's not lignin with an I. These are completely different things. A lignan with an A is simply um, these uh, natural products that have this beta-beta linkage. And if it's a non-beta-beta link linkage, then that's a neolignin. And two neolignans that come from magnolia that have phenolic groups as well are hinochial and magnolol. And the, we, we thought that these might be interesting to make polycarbonates from these and also do other chemistries as well. And that's because they're uh, available on large scale. Um, they've been uh, studied for their therapeutic uh, benefits uh, and, and for um, treating, for instance, cardiovascular disease and, and inflammation. And we also thought that in addition to the uh, phenols that could be used to make a polycarbonate, they have these alkenes uh, dangling on, off of the, the framework that could be used for other chemistry as well. So they're already highly functional uh, structures that we could use uh, to build up interesting materials. So Kevin Wacker took on this project, and, and he put together this roadmap of how he was going to take hinochial and magnolol in all these directions and make polycarbonates, make thermosets, and make polyolefins. And that, this is the roadmap. It's a little overwhelming. And I can say that you know, we've had some success. So condensation polymerization builds up these polycarbonates. We're looking into using these for other things, including, say, by thiolene cross-linking reactions, studying the degradation, et cetera. Uh, if instead uh, the phenols are either just ignored or tied up in some kind of a protecting uh, group scheme, then the alkenes can be used to make thermoset materials. Um, the tying up the phenols can also be followed by uh, metathesis polymerization to build up polyolefin materials. So like I said, he's made progress in all of these areas. I just want to show you one, and that's this um, lower area here. Uh, converting hinochial or magnolol into uh, thermosets. And the chemistry is really straightforward, and it's scalable, it's, it's simple, and it's diverse. So in this particular scheme, we're just starting from magnolol right here. And it can be, um, the, the phenols can be protected in several different ways. We can tie them up into uh, a ketal. We can uh, install carbonate groups that then carry additional alkenes. Uh, we can uh, install an ether functionality that again brings in additional alkenes. So we can have uh, two alkenal groups here, four in each of these cases. That controls the degree of uh, cross-linking in the materials. And the cross-linking is, is straightforward by thiolene chemistry. So we add a multifunctional thiol 
together with a photo initiator and then irradiate with light that generates radicals that causes the thiolene chemistry to take place and we can build up a series of different networks. In fact, Kevin found that he didn't even have to get rid of the uh, phenols. He could simply do the thiolene chemistry directly uh, on magnolol. And so the reason I'm showing you this is because we're pretty excited about the fact that they have these um, relatively high stabilities to hydrolytic degradation uh, depending upon the conditions. But once they do hydrolyze, then they release small molecules that have these uh, phenols and those can serve as radical scavengers. And so they have this radical scavenging ability and that then leads to uh, interesting um, uh, effects for biomedical applications. So we found that they're, uh, they're compatible in terms of cells growing on them. We've looked at reactive oxygen species assays and they do seem to scavenge, uh, uh, again, these, these um, radical uh, species. And so we're looking into doing 3D printing to make biomedical devices that can be used, say, uh, in bone repair or cardiovascular stenting, et cetera. And this is a collaboration that's just started with Andrew Dove and Andrew Weems at the University of Birmingham. Okay, so I'm running a little bit short on time, so let me come back uh, to uh, the overall goals. So um, remember, we were making the amphiphilic block copolymers so we could create those hybrid inorganic organic materials for capturing pollutants. And then I went on that tangent of the, the uh, Hinochial and Magnolol as natural products to build these thermoset materials. But if we want to make um, the, the hybrid inorganic organic nanoparticle systems, we need amphiphilic block copolymers. So we need to have controlled uh, polymerization strategies to build up those block polymers. So in this particular block polymer, if you look at the chain ends, you'll see that it was initiated by this moiety and terminated by this moiety, and that the polymerization mechanism involved atom transfer radical polymerization. So if we want to use natural products to build up polymers that are block polymer structures, we need chemistry uh, to do so. And that chemistry was developed by Kuichiro Mikami, a postdoc in the group, again about five years ago, where Kuichiro had recognized that if he made a cyclic carbonate of glucose, where the one, two, and three positions are protected, then he could do, uh, add an initiator and use an organo-based catalyst and conduct controlled ring opening polymerization and establish a polycarbonate backbone where the repeat units are glucose. Okay, so that's the background chemistry. And when he characterized these materials by Maldi-Toff mass spectrometry, he confirmed that the initiator that he had added initiated the polymer. It was terminated by a proton and that there was a separation in mass uh, according to the repeat unit um, that was expected. And so what this means is that if we can initiate, propagate, and terminate, then we can grow another block on the end. And so that's what Lu Su has done. She's developed this uh, strategy by which to make a series of different um, cyclic carbonates of glucose. So Quichros was protecting the one, two, and three positions with methyl uh, protecting groups. But Lu recognized that she could take this in many different directions and use, say, other longer alkyl chains in an ether linkage, but more importantly, install the protecting groups for these two and three positions through a carbonate linkage so that she has a cyclic carbonate for ring opening polymerization and these groups can be lost later. So upon hydrolysis, this will lead to methyl glucose, which ultimately breaks down to glucose, carbon dioxide, and ethanol. So this is a, a monomer that she spent a lot of time working with. And then an analog to that has the one ethyl carbonate protecting group on the two position, but then a propargyl carbonate on the three position. This brings an alkyno, uh, alkynal group, which can be used to click on other functionalities onto the backbone of the polymer. So with just these two monomers, she can make a series of polymers. Um, so starting with an initiator, adding the one cyclic carbonate that has the propargyl uh, group in the three position, uh, conducting the ring opening polymerization, everything's well controlled uh, in terms of the kinetics and the, and the chain growth. And then she can take that initially made polymer and use that as a macro initiator, relying upon this hydroxyl group at the end to initiate the ring opening polymerization of the second monomer. That gives a dye block structure where one block segment has the propargyl group, the other does not. And that means that 
the, this entire polymer is hydrophobic, but she can now do chemistry here to make an amphiphilic polymer. So for instance, she can take that alkyne and react it with an uh, azide through the standard alkyne azide click reaction and bring in an oligo oligoethylene oxide as a hydrophilic moiety. That transforms this block into hydro being hydrophilic. This one re remains as hydrophobic, so this is an amphiphilic polymer. She could also do thiol ion reactions using, say, uh, various thiols that bring in either positive or negatively charged groups, so she can make neutral positive, negative, and even Zwitter ionic uh, hydrophilic chain segments. So from each of these dye block copolymers, then she could, co she could assemble those in aqueous solution. Uh, we published this work just about a year ago, where she showed that simply by direct dissolution into water, in some cases, she could produce well-defined micelles, um, which you can see the TEM image here, and the dynamic light scattering uh, histograms. These are quite uniform structures. Um, in the case of the uh, negatively charged polymer, she did have to go back to our old method of going from an organic solvent to water, and she obtained vesicles as opposed to, to micelles. But from this work that Lou did, now May is a current PhD student who is taking all of these pieces and putting them together. So this is the, the end story on this. So again, starting from a natural product, uh, glucose, and, and we can form the methyl glucose, then she can transform that into a series of different monomers, build up block copolymers that are amphiphilic, co-assemble those with the uh, inorganic iron oxide nanoparticles. You can see some of her images here, and then use those to clean up uh, the crude oil. And then if they are lost in the environment, they'll break down to glucose, carbon dioxide, ethanol, and a couple of other little uh, small molecules. OK, so one more uh, take home message. Um, one of the things that I've been uh, proposing uh, to my students, uh, again, is that they always consider, again, the whole life cycle of, of their materials. And what I tell them is that we need to be uh, thinking about how life um, operates uh, on, a, on a global scale, uh, even outside of our laboratory. And uh, they, they think this is funny, but um, you know, in the animal world, there's a lot of recycling that goes on. Um, you know, animals eat animals. Um, uh, animals eat plants. Um, plants even eat animals. <laughs> and uh, there's also a lot of restructuring in the mineral world. So um, animals and plants use minerals, and, and, and minerals uh, undergo uh, transformations uh, as well. So um, I hope that was a fun, fun uh, <laughs> slide toward the end. Let me also summarize that I mentioned that, that we're using Hinocchiol and Magnolol as a natural product. We're also using other polyphenolic compounds like quercetin. Um, ferulic acid, uh, amino acids in forming polypeptides. Uh, we've done a lot of work with quinic acid and transforming that into uh, materials that, say, could be used in orthopedic applications. Um, and one of our most abundant uh, natural product that we're using and making functional materials is glucose. And so we're trademarking this term sugar plastics. Uh, I hope you like it. And we uh, actually started a company last December uh, that's called Sugar Plastics. And we have a website, sugarplastics.com. There's not much on the website yet, but we're getting things going. Okay, I'd like to thank my students uh, and uh, the, the um, people who did the work. Uh, I tried to point them out throughout the presentation. I'd also like to acknowledge the National Science Foundation and the Welch Foundation for uh, financial support. And I'd like to thank you so much for your attention this afternoon, or morning. <laughs> Beautiful science. OK, questions? Yes, yes. I have two questions. Uh, the first is about the oil recovery. Uh, I noticed that you recover the net particle by the mag magnet. But how can you infer the, the net particle is fully <coughs> by the magnet? Yes, that's a, that's a very good question. So in, in these cases, we're in a vial, and everything's self-contained. So we, in Jenny's case, she did some experiments and found that she could recover 90 to 93%. But in the, in the real world, that it's going to be a very different situation, right? I mean, we, in fact, the idea for this came, um, again, after the, the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, when, when they couldn't re recover the oil, they began throwing out dispersants. And dispersants are just surfactant molecules that are meant to break up the oil into small droplets and allow it to be um, uh, bioremediated. And so we thought, well, that's throwing pollution upon pollution. And that's why we wanted to have the magnetic recovery. Our particles could be the same problem. They could be 
pollution on top of pollution unless we have a way to retrieve them, like you were saying. So we're anticipating that we wouldn't use these like out in a large volume of water, but rather like right before a water intake, right? So let's say there's, there's um, uh, drinking water or cooling water that's, that's being pumped into, into a, an, an intake site. We could put these out ahead of that, and then the flow would bring them in. We would have magnetic coils around the pipes that then would uh, be used to collect the particles. But it's a big problem. We don't want to put pollution after pollution. Yeah. I have a solution because uh, <laughs> if you're, if you're, <laughs> synthesizing your polymer, I know that you just use the carbon rock agent to do the polymerization. Uh, actually, our group have a uh, LED labeled rock agent so that after doing the polymerization, uh, the, the three block uh, polymer, and at one end, it has a TPE uh, that is, can be emissive when it's uh, self sample. After you uh, recover the that particle is massive, I think there are still tiny amount of that particle that we cannot see by naked eyes. So, mm -hmm. but you should shine you out. You can see it. Okay, okay. But then, how do you get it though? You you can see it, but then how do you how do you collect it? <laughs> uh, at least uh, you, you know. Yeah, you know. Yes. I have still uh, a second question. <laughs> about the sustainable polymer. I noticed that the old polymer are synthesized by the uh, cyclic carbonate. Yes. Right? By the drink opening fermentation to do the fermentation. Yes, we know that the cyclic carbonate are synthesized from the toxic phosphate. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so um, uh, yeah, that's that's a question we often receive, and industrial scientists tell us it's no big deal that that phosgene is is worked with, you know, um, routinely. But we're actually working on strategies to not use phosgene, and we have a collaboration with Don Derensberg to um, yeah, yeah, yeah. use carbon dioxide to yeah, make yeah, our carbonates. Uh, yeah. Because I'm I'm well familiar with Don Derensberg. Yes. It's yes. Because yes. my background is also the co-production of. CO2 and the oxide. Mm -hmm. My stance mm -hmm. is that can you make the the monomer into the uh, oxide monomer then compare it? We're we're working on that right now in a collaboration with Don. Yeah, great idea. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your talk. I was wondering, you actually you skip really fast through about the actual removing the oil from that assembly. A supermolecular assembly itself. So, I was wondering what would be the process for actually recovering the oil from the nanoparticles. That's that's a good point. Yeah, I, I really did not go into that in detail, and it is tricky though, because the um, the particles themselves they have the hydrophobic chains inside. They have this cross-linked shell that's a, a network, and if we use a really good solvent for the polymer, then those chains can reptate out, but they're still connected. And so the particle then becomes hydrophobic on the outside. It, 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 it basically inverts, right? So it's tricky. We have to use a solvent that will bring out the oil, but not invert the, the particle. And so um, I don't remember exactly what Adriana and Jenny were using to do that. But I, I mean, I can take a look at it and see. Yeah. Uh Earlier on, you said that the different size of the nanoparticle will affect the efficiency of the construction. Uh, do you target the different morphology of the, different morphology of the nanoparticles, such as porous or, or star? So yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so we're, we actually have a, a big collaboration to uh, look into making different morphologies, um, uh, elongated rod-like structures, um, more flat disc-like structures and things. We, we think that that might be important to the, to the behavior of the materials, yes? Maybe the porosity is uh, another. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> yes. Uh, the natural products of this polymer are uh, very interesting. Yeah. So, Extremely interesting. Yeah, <laughs> yeah well degradable or well compatibility. Yeah. So I'm just curious about it. how do you choose this kind of uh, natural products at the bottom of the screen the natural products or to have some central 
Yeah, so, so th this all started um, when I was at Washington University in St. Louis and talking with orthopedic surgeons who were explaining that they needed a degradable material for bone repair because they were using metals and they'd have to go back and, and remove them. And there are issues with things like polylactic acid and polyglycolic acid because they break down to hydroxy acids, which are corrosive and, and uncomfortable um, for, the, for the person. And so I started thinking about uh, you know, cellulose and how that's nature's structural material, but humans don't have cellulase enzymes. So I just wanted to make a polycarbonate of glucose to have it be like cellulose in terms of mechanical properties and have a modulus that's similar to that of, of bone, um, but be hydrolytically degradable. And so that we, once we started with glucose, then every student who joins this project just like finds their own favorite natural product, right? They, whatever, one person likes magnolia trees, so they choose something from magnolia trees. Another person wants something that will, you know, cure cancer, and so they, you know, work, work with that. So it's just based on each student, yeah. How, how about the processability of that? Yeah, so the processability, that's, so when, when I mentioned cellulose, I bet that triggered, hey, that's really hard to work with. Um, at this point, they're processable because we haven't had them fully deprotected. And in fact, we, we just published a paper about a month ago on some um, five-membered cyclic carbonate ring opening reactions of glucose. And we were able to deprotect them. And they're really processable because they're water soluble. It's, it's, it's amazing, you know, yeah. So surprisingly processable, yeah. Thank you. Thank you.